Well, good morning and welcome. We're glad that you're joining us this morning. And here it's a, a cool and a wet May morning. But I'm thinking that we'll have uh, some beautiful weather for the weekend and want to encourage you to celebrate uh, your mothers in your life. Uh, happy Mother's Day to you. We began uh, a new series today. We finished last week with Habakkuk. This morning, uh, we want to begin with some inescapable truths during this time of crisis, pandemic. And so we want to just draw you alongside of us. And this morning, in fact, we'll think of uh, what is God saying through the virus? Now we're going to draw some lessons from 1 Peter in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1. And while you're finding 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, let's bow in prayer and ask for the Spirit's help for this study. Heavenly Father, give us ears to hear what you are saying and hearts that are humble enough and wills that are obedient enough to follow where you're pointing us to, for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, and we'll read verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And so ends the reading of God's holy word this morning. Well, a lot has changed in these recent days, hasn't it? As one writer put it a bit ago, Corona was the name of a beer. Hand sanitizer was something you used only when you visited someone in the hospital and some of us probably thought that COVID-19 was the name of a planet in a Star Trek episode. It's all far more serious now. I read of a pastor whose good friend asked him, do you think all this disease is a judgment from God? That is a good question. I wonder how you might respond to that. I love how Hugh Palmer responded when he said, um, well, it's not his final judgment. For Jesus said that would be far worse. You remember Jesus went on to tell us then not to fear a virus which can kill the body, but can do no more, but fear him who after the killing of the body has the power to throw you into hell. I went on to say at the same time, though, this is clearly part of God's warning judgment that something is wrong with the world. It's part of living under the curse that sin provoked because sin has consequences and we can't avoid them for we all get called up in them. And it's not saying that anyone with the symptoms is a far worse sinner. No, no, far from that. It's just that we live in a sin-drenched world. 
and we have to live with its consequences, which include pandemics like this. Indeed, this is God's reminder that something is wrong, that God speaking to our world, speaking to us, reminds us that life, our life, is more fragile than we like to think. After all, here is a virus that we can't see, yet it can be anywhere. You can get it and, and not have symptoms at all, and yet it might kill me. It's no respecter of persons or borders or ethnicities. It may have come from China, but, but it's, it's not a Chinese virus. It's just as home in the USA as it is in Afghanistan. It's as home in uh, the UK as it is in Iran. It's as at home in France as it is in Nigeria. James, uh, the apostle, has uh, some words that uh, are significant at this time. In fact, they take on a fresh impact as we think of our current situation. James writes in his letter in the New Testament at, verse, at chapter 4, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and buy and sell and make money. Isn't that all of us? We've all made plans. We put them in our day timers. It's, it's normal life. Only not anymore. And James goes on to say in verse 14 of that same chapter, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Who of us hasn't had to cancel plans, postpone meetings, empty our calendars? What is your life? James says. Well, it's less significant than I imagine. You are a mist, he says, that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And when it does, they won't even allow many at the funeral today. Yes, our life is more fragile than we think. That little bubble that we create for ourselves has burst. That myth that somehow we, we are in control of life, of our lives. Uh, much like we control the heating and air in our own homes with a remote. Or as we can move money from one bank account to another simply at the press of a button. The myth that that, that applies to our life. That's all been exposed as an illusion by the virus. And yet, we love that myth, don't we? But life is more fragile than we like to think. And as God speaks this lesson into our lives at this time, he reinforces it. For our gods are more fragile than we like to think as well. Again and again, as Palmer says, what we like to worship, stake our confidence on, invest our energies in, they've all come crashing down. Indeed, the noise of idols has been deafening these past weeks. Take money, or as the Bible says, mammon. Well, these have been Weeks of stock market crashes. The Dow Jones has suffered its largest loss in over three decades. The Wall Street fear gauge has topped the levels that they had in the financial crisis of 2008. And what is going to happen to small businesses and restaurants, mom and pop stores, doesn't even bear thinking about. What about sports? 
That great idol has been decimated. Wherever you look, it's disappeared. March Madness became March Sadness immediately, and baseball didn't even begin. Wimbledon, tennis, Olympics, and many uh, motorsports racing all fallen. Sports' ability to capture our passions, seize our loyalties, control our emotions, all gone in the blink of an eye. It happens wherever we look. Education reduced immediately to confusion, with schools simply closing, ending mid-semester, and many of them scrambling to do some makeshift of online education um, to little success. Universities shutting down, students returning home without completing their semester, unable to graduate. So many plans canceled. And what about leisure or trips, airlines, Going bust, flights canceled, travel banned, people stuck on cruise ships or in hotels and Disney of all places down. Destinations closed. And entertainment, the theater, the cinemas, concert halls, clothes, shows canceled. Months and months now of creative desert and the lifelessness of our idols, all exposed. Friend, God could hardly say more clearly, something is wrong. Our lives as we've thought about them, our gods as we choose them, are not as we imagined. They are more fragile than we like to think. But are you listening? Even when God speaks as clearly as he has spoken, are we deaf to him? They say that since this pandemic started, that the canals in Venice have become clear. You can see the fish in them now. The air and uh, pollution in London has become cleaner. The pollution in our big cities has significantly diminished. It's almost as if a global environmental reset button has been pushed. But there's a bigger question for us. Will a global or even personal spiritual reset button be pushed? Or will it be when this pandemic eventually leaves us that we will just put uh, our lives back as they were and reinstate our idols as though we hadn't heard a word God was saying? Uh, many groups have called for days of special prayer, and that is certainly what we need. But we would do well to start with that of repentance. And not just that something is wrong, but that I've gone wrong. And we who call ourselves Christians are not immune to this virus, are we? No, we're not left out of the warning. We've imagined falsely that our lives were in our control. And so we've installed other gods as our idols. We've, we've tasted the rum in life. We need the warning. but We can hear it and still have hope. And when God is speaking to everyone in this pandemic, when he is saying that something has gone wrong with this world, he is reminding us all of the fragility of life. 
But when he speaks to us, when he speaks to his own people through this pandemic, I think one of the lessons that he speaks at this time is about the genuineness of our faith. And that's the phrase I want us to focus on from this reading out of 1 Peter, at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, where Peter writes, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter writes about the genuineness of your faith and he puts great value judgment on on it being worth more, far more than gold which perishes, he tells us. That's surprising to us uh, because we put so much value on gold and the reason why we think it's so valuable is because we think it doesn't perish. Oh, stocks and shares may plummet, currency values may rise and fall, but, but gold holds its value. But Peter knows that there is a day coming when even the value of gold will collapse. And on that day, currencies will be worthless too. There'll be no point in playing the markets because there will be no markets to play. On that day, what will have real value is genuine, godly, biblical faith. Oh, not not the faith that just drifted with the crowd and the culture, but went to church with the family and just tagged along. No, but a faith that even in life's trials, even in coronavirus's isolation, even when no one else could see it and it cost you dearly, that faith that clung to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to his praise and honor. That's the faith that will be proven genuine not a faith that just merely goes along to get along. Now, the question for us is, will our faith have that value over these past days and indeed the coming months ahead? Or will it just get lost with so many of the routines of life that supported it, services and meetings and familiar faces because so much of the church scaffolding has come down, hasn't it? For the church has been deemed unable to gather together. Church programs, church meetings, church friends, church expectations, all silenced. And we'll start to see that if underneath them all, whether our faith is genuine or just a token faith. Verse 7 in Peter's writing speaks of the proven genuineness of your faith. Faith that's exposed to trials, faith that's exposed to the virus, if you like, and faith that is proven by them because Trials are to faith what fire is to gold. Uh, Trials are a refining agent. You see, in those days, as Peter was writing this letter to his people, he wrote about the process of refining gold. They, They would heat up gold until all the rubbish, all the dross would would rise to the surface, come to the top, and you'd skim it off, and you'd skim it off, and you'd skim it off again and again, and until all you had was pure gold left. Well, it's like that with trials. It proves the genuineness of your faith. You remember the book of Job in the Old Testament? Remember in the beginning of that book how Satan goes to God and when God points to Job as one of his choice believers, Satan describes him 
rather as a fair weather kind of Christian. Of course he believes, he goes on. He's got a nice home. He's, he's got a good job. He's got a nice family. But, but get rid of those. And Job loses the war far more brutally, of course, than our social distancing or self-isolation. Throughout the course of that book, Job has huge grief. But the genuineness of his faith is exposed. And something of that is the opportunity that lies before you and me, before us during this time. I read recently the account of a young man who had taken a real battering in life, a real beating. He was talking with his pastor and telling him that at one point, what, what really seemed to help him was the counsel of, of an older believer, a, a mature person of God, who said to him the simple phrase, let your trials refine you. Don't let them define you. Let it refine you, not define you. You've seen people who've let their trials define them. Uh, they've become victims. That, that is, their, their identity has taken on that of a victim. Oh, I got the virus. I, I lost my job. I, I lost track of my life. I, I couldn't get it all together. All because of the pandemic. Yes, yes. But friend, trials don't define the person. All of that can be true. And you can still be a child of God. God says, show me the genuineness of your faith. And what an opportunity today, as Peter writes about that, with so many props removed. What a day for the genuineness of our faith to be exposed. Show me the genuineness of your faith because it is faith that links us to the hope because faith links us to Jesus and he is our hope. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, you cannot please God. Faith in Jesus Christ, he's our hope. Faith isn't faith in the stars or some obscure higher power, but it's faith in Jesus Christ as one person called him, the death defeater God. Now, Christians, we, we aren't given um, exemption from the virus, but we are given hope when we face it. Hope even if it does its worst. Faith's genuineness is shown in confidence in the face of death. And faith's genuineness is shown in our unselfish, gracious serving of others. Now, Peter will go on and write his letter to the elect exiles, to those saints who are suffering. And as he goes on and writes this letter, and Lord willing, in the next few months, we'll study this letter in its entirety. But Peter will, will, will write about uh, encouraging you and me to go on loving one another deeply from the heart. He'll, he'll say, use whatever gift you have to serve others. John Wyatt, a Christian medical doctor, um, writes about the faith of Christian medical professionals who serve others on the front line in the face of death and how that, that's been the case down through the centuries 
and he traces out in the different centuries with the different epidemics and pandemics how that Christians have been on the front line serving in those places. And he describes the Ebola epidemic in 2014 and how many of the nurses and the doctors in Sierra Leone sacrificed their lives to care for the Ebola victims. How many of those uh, doctors and nurses were Christians. Some of us were aware of that, but what we may not have known as he goes on to explain this, those doctors and nurses knew their protective equipment that they had was substandard and despite their best efforts would not completely protect them. And yet, in hope of Christ, they kept on caring day after day after day for the Ebola victims. Now, coronavirus is not Ebola. No, no. It falls way short of Ebola's lethal percentages. But in this darkest of times, what a wonderful light will be held out if scattered across our community, if scattered throughout our nation, if scattered throughout the world, there was a community of people confident not in their immunity from disease, but in Jesus' ability to defeat death. What if there was a community of people who rose up who met fear with faith in a world where selfishness still reigns. Who of us can't remember the toilet paper shortage or the sanitizer downfall because of the greedy hoarding of folks? But what if there rises up a community of people whose hope is in the one who defeats death. And they serve in unselfish ways. What a remarkable light that will be to a dark, dark world. What's God saying to us? Peter reminds us in these verses the fragility of life. That's what God speaks to everyone. Dear friend, do you know that your life is like a mist? In the blink of an eye, it could be gone. Are you prepared for eternity? Are you ready to face your mortality, your death? You can be. If you will place your hope, rest your confidence, place your faith in the one who has come into this world, taking on our bodies, and who himself has died for our sin and raised from the dead. If you will place your faith in that one, Jesus Christ our Lord. You can be ready for eternity. You can be one of those people whose confidence is not in immunity, but is in Jesus Christ. And do you know that even if the virus would do its worst to you, that that's not the end for you. And so I invite you to rest your heart in Christ and talk with us. If you have never done that and you don't know how to, please contact us through the website um, at our Facebook page. We'd love to talk with you about how you too can have the hope of eternity. But for those of you, God not only speaks to all of us about the fragility of life, but for those of you 
who have faith. God speaks to us about the genuineness of your faith. Come September this fall, will your faith be refined or will it have disappeared? Will it be proven genuine or will it just have slipped away? Oh, dear friend, I trust that you will see that in the midst of all of this darkness, your faith is shining brightly for others to see the goodness of God. Let us pray. I want to pray as Peter prayed for these suffering saints in his letter. May the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Glory to his name. In Jesus we pray. Amen.